Grand Ole Opry star Minnie Pearl has long been known to radio listeners and TV fans here in Tennessee and all over the nation. She's brought a lot of joy and laughter to her fans, and her kind of humor runs deep. Recently, I talked with Sarah Cannon, who is Minnie Pearl, and during the interview, it was difficult at times to determine which was Minnie and which was Sarah, as we discussed developments in Minnie's character and her part in the history of the broadcasting industry. For Sarah Cannon and Minnie, there have been awards and recognition far surpassing any which might have been thought of at the beginning of their careers, not only for parts they've played on radio and TV, but for just plain everyday living. And now for an insight into the character of Minnie Pearl, here is Sarah Cannon as Minnie, beginning our conversation with her long-standing and familiar greeting. Howdy! I'm just so proud to be here. <laughs> now, has this always been your opening line on the Grand Ole Opry in your act? Yes, it's always been um, my salutation. Uh, it's a funny thing, Lynn. When I first started on the air in 1940, when I first brought Minnie Pearl to the public uh, professionally on the radio, I used a very different type of salutation. It was the same words, but uh, the... the uh, the decibels were different. The sound level was different. Uh, now I scream it out very loud, and at that time that I came on, it was a very gentle howdy, which I had heard people say all my life, having come from the country, and it was howdy. I'm just so proud to be here. Then when I went on the um, network in 1942 on NBC, on the Prince Albert Network portion of the Grand Ole Opry, the agency out of New York suggested that I scream it as a sort of a promotional stunt. And they had the announcer go out before the Opry, before the network portion of the Opry, and say, when Minnie Pearl says howdy, say howdy right back. And over the years, I got louder and louder, and the audience got louder and louder as they responded. And uh, at first, I sort of rejected it, because uh, at the time I created Minnie Pearl, she was not quite that loud, not quite that raucous. But uh, in the years that have passed, and I've seen how the audience loves to participate, I really enjoy having people scream it at me when I scream it at them. Well, too, it's uh, necessary, I know, to exaggerate to some extent when you're doing any kind of performance like that. Well, that's true, just like the, the, the character herself. She started out being um, a gentle, very authentic girl from the mountains and a composite of all the country girls that I had known over the years and met in my travels, uh, but she has, uh, she's never become a caricature. I've tried very hard to keep her from ever being a caricature, but she is a much more, uh, shall we say, brassy type than she was when she started. Uh, it would be almost uh, implausible for people to think that she could be around as long as she has and not picked up a few city tricks. <laughs> You say you started in 1940. Now, that was 35 years ago, and you've been Minnie Pearl all this time. Well, Minnie Pearl actually was created in 1938. Uh, I, I had a, a job uh, producing amateur plays around the southeast, and I had began to collect country music and country stories, and uh, I created this character and named her in 1938, Minnie Pearl, because I thought that Minnie and Pearl were two of the nicest country names I could think of. So I used her professionally, but not uh, on the air until 40. But um, she's uh, actually ageless. I never have figured, it's right funny, uh, during this celebration that we've had this year, the 50th anniversary of the Grand Ole Opry, so many people have interviewed me and asked me about my 35 years with the show, and they have asked me about the age of Minnie Pearl. They know the age of the Opry. It's 50. And they want to know how old Minnie Pearl is, and I always give them the same answer. I wish I could be her age, because she has never, she's never uh, aged one bit. She's the same age she was when I created her. And I really don't know how old she is, except that um, she's young at heart. And I I would say usually when I think of her, she's in her maybe, I don't know, late uh, 20s, early 30s, or maybe a little bit older than that. Back where she came from, uh, a girl was uh, an old maid if she wasn't married by the time she was 25, and she's always been an old maid. So she's between 25 and 35, I guess. 
She's from a place called Grinder's Switch, and I'm assuming that's uh, uh, Tennessee. Now, is there really a place called Grinder's Switch? And are you yourself, Sarah Cannon, from Grinder's Switch? Well, I'm from Centerville, Tennessee, which is 50 miles southwest of here in Nashville. And um, when I was a little girl, my father had a lumber business, and there was a, a, a railroad company that... Um, called the NC in St. Al, Nashville, Chattanooga, St. Louis Railroad, um, had a loading switch three miles from my hometown of Centerville, and it was called Grinder Switch because the uh, family that lived there, there weren't many families, but the largest family was the family of, of Grinders. The man's name was Mr. Grinders, and he had a large family, and so they called the little switch, uh, the loading switch for the railroad, Grinder Switch, and Daddy used to take I had four sisters, and he used to take us five little girls up there, and it was a big event to pack a lunch and go to grind a switch. So when WSM um, agreed to let me come on the Opry, I didn't have a locale at that time. I spoke of my hometown, but I didn't call it grind a switch. And so when they got ready for that momentous audition that night on uh, WSM, the first week of November, in 1940, they said, we think you ought to have a locale. This was at the time when Judy Canova was on, and she was from Unadilla, and Bob um, Burns was from Van Buren, Arkansas. So I picked Grinder Switch because I didn't think anybody would be offended. So few families lived there. But since then, it's become a mythical place. I have peopled it with my own people, and uh, I'm the only person really in the world who really can see in my mind's eye and hear in my ears the sound of the people who live there, whom I have created. What kind of an education does Minnie Pearl have, and how does that compare with your educational background? <laughs> well, we seldom mention education in, in connection with Minnie Pearl. As a matter of fact, Lynn, that's very interesting. I never had that question asked me. I had two years of college. I went to Ward Belmont, a very fine school, and I went to Ward Belmont here in Nashville because uh, I wanted to take advantage of the great dramatic department that they had here, and a fine teacher, Miss Pauline Sherwood Townsend. And my family at that time had just come through the Depression, or was coming through the Depression, and they offered me two years at Ward Belmont, or four years at the university, and I wanted the dramatic department uh, at Ward Belmont, so I chose the two years. And that's all the formal college training I ever had. Now, as far as Minnie Pearl is concerned, um, I never have thought about it, but I guess she must have maybe gone through high school. I don't know if they had a high school, a full high school uh, at Grinder Switch or not. I know she has many gags that she tells about uh, being in school and about trying to get her brother to go to school. And coming home from school or something that happened down at the school. So there is a school at Grinder's Switch, that, uh, the, the mythical place she lives in now. And um, it's a sort of a center of the community activity next to the church. Of course, the church is the main um, uh, center of activity. But um, she makes grammatical errors constantly, which uh, never has offended, apparently, anybody because... Uh, that's just the gentle, shall we say, patois or the uh, language of the hills of Tennessee and uh, northern Alabama and western North Carolina, the area of mountainous um, country that I was traveling when I really, when I created her. And she's a mountain girl, and uh, she's, uh, she's never worried about her education. She's never been intimidated, actually, by educated people. You notice I always speak over in the third person. <laughs> I don't think I've ever done a per an interview with two people <laughs> and yet talked with the same person while doing well, it. She's a very real person uh, to me. Um, uh, I, have, I have had a, a very wonderful time with her. Uh, I love to get into her skin when I work and put on the white cotton stockings and the one strap black Mary Jane shoes. Uh, they're the only ones I've ever had and I value them very highly. I cherish those shoes. I've had many dresses and uh, she always wears a clean starch dress and, and uh, the white cotton stockings and the, the Mary Jane shoes and the hat with the uh, straw hat with the flowers and 
the price tag, which I inadvertently left on one night from some flowers I brought, bought at the 10 cent store and got a lot of comment on it, so I left it, and it's become a, very much of a trademark. But um, she's a, a, a very satisfactory person to live with because um, she has no hang-ups and no problems, and all of us would like to be that way, wouldn't we? <laughs> Yes, we would. Has her style of dress ever changed at all? How about the size? Has the size changed? Ah, <laughs> that's not very fair of you to say that. Yes, a little. Um, I was a very slender person when I came on the opera in 1940, and uh, it was really funny. My sister wrote my material for the first two years that I came on the opera, and then when I went with the network, the agency uh, began uh, having writers. And at that time, I was so skinny. I wasn't slender. I was skinny. I weighed 110 pounds, and I was 5 feet 8 inches tall, so I was very, very thin. They wrote thin gags about me. And then after I married, uh, I began to cook and began to more or less pay more attention to eating. But I, I don't think before I married, I was 35 before I married, I I was on the road constantly, seven days a week, and for seven years before I met my husband. And we always just, we didn't pay much attention to food. But I began to gain a little weight then, and uh, the gags changed from skinny gags to fat gags. <laughs> Not that I've ever been very fat, but I mean, yeah, she, she changed the size of the costume a little. I mean, I imagine maybe one or two sizes up, but... Uh, She's changed the material of the costumes rather than the style because of the drip dry and the traveling that I've done. I've almost had to be functional and practical about that. But um, they always have ruffles and they're always clean and they're always uh, made in some form that would be country. And most attractive, too. Well, you're very kind. Uh, of course, the Opry began as a radio show, and now it's done with a live audience in the Grand Ole Opry House here in Nashville. And much of it is televised from time to time, and you appear on TV programs so much. Have you always worn the costume, even when nobody was uh, in the audience? Well, you see, we've always had an audience uh, at the Opry, but... On radio, if there is not an audience, I don't usually wear the costume. But I find it, it is not difficult to drop into the character, whether I'm in costume or out of costume. Uh, if, uh, if I am on a radio program where I am Mini Pearl only, which I have on many occasions, of course. Uh, we used to have, uh, uh, back when, before the, uh, uh, before the, the times changed, you might say. We had a lot of uh, commercial programs that came out of the studio up at WSM radio station on the fifth floor of the building up there. And um, we would do radio programs quite uh, frequently there, and I did many Pearl just in my regular clothes. Um, she's, she's, uh, she's a voice with me as much as, as the costume, and uh, I can drop into her without a particle of trouble regardless of whether I'm in costume or not. I know her very well. <laughs> I know you've made a lot of other appearances. I can remember seeing you on Ralph Edwards' This Is Your Life when you were honored on that program. What are some of the other programs that you've appeared on in some of the places? You've been in Carnegie Hall, I think, yeah. Madison Square Garden, yeah. and some others possibly? Yeah. Well. Uh, in 35 years of show business, uh, 27 of those years, 27 of the 35 years have been one-night stands. So you can imagine how many places I have played. I, I did play Carnegie Hall, and I did play Madison Square Garden, and uh, I always wanted to play the Old Palace Theater in New York. I never did get a chance to play that. And I've played some of the largest um, coliseums and the Astrodome and all the big, a lot of the big places, and I have played some very beautiful uh, places out of this country, like the uh, Titania Palace in uh, Berlin and uh, the uh, Music Hall in Vienna. Different places when we were doing soldier shows during our different wars, and um, I have played on uh, many of the uh, top TV shows: the Dean Martin Show, the Carol Burnett, the. Jim Neighbors, oh, I, I, I couldn't begin to name them, and they are 
they're exciting to me. And sometimes Minnie Pearl has come off well, and sometimes she hasn't. Um, it all depends on how she's handled. Uh, she's very much like a, to me, uh, she's very much like a very sensitive horse or um, thoroughbred animal. Uh, if, she's, if she's treated properly, uh, she responds. But if I get the feeling that someone uh, doesn't quite understand Minnie Pearl, who's handling the show, or she's presented in the wrong skit or with the wrong material, she sort of disappears, and I can't find her. But most of the time, she comes off with a sort of a gay abandon and doesn't seem to bother about whether uh, she's coming off well or not. She has a great deal of confidence, the, the, the character does, without being show-offy or conceited, but she's very confident in the fact that she never is anything. She, she's, she's, there's nothing phony about her. She's just a country girl who never won a beauty contest and loves to have a good time and loves to make people laugh and loves everybody. That's the most important thing. That's what it's all about with her, is love. You've received many awards, I know, and two of the highest awards have been received this year. Could you explain those, please? Yes, this has been a good year. Uh, I was uh, flattered and pleased and complimented and thrilled to receive the... Uh, Brotherhood Award for the National Council of Christians and Jews in May, which was an exciting award. Another, uh, while we're in a bragging humor, I don't usually blow my horn quite as loudly as I'm doing it today, but um, I also was awarded my first degree this year, the same week that I won the Brotherhood Award of uh, the National Council of Christians and Jews. I was um, awarded... Um, the de degree of humane letters, the doctor doctorate of humane letters by the Kentucky Wesleyan College. So I am a doctor. I'm very proud of that. <laughs> That's the only way I'd ever get a degree, Lynn. <laughs> I'd never get a degree any other way except an honorary degree. And it was quite an exciting experience that morning in May up there to receive on that college campus that uh, uh, purple stole to put around my neck. And I thought uh, how far... Um, Minnie Pearl has come from the school at Grinder Switch to be awarded that. But um, I value very highly that doctorate because um, I think to get the Doctorate of Humane Letters probably means more to me than a scholastic or academic doctorate would mean. You had a high award in the country music field also. Yes, I did. Then last month I was uh, awarded Two months ago it was. Time gets by so quickly. Um, I was awarded, finally, a place in the Country Music Hall of Fame. And, of course, um, this was significant. Uh, as a woman, this was significant to me because uh, the only other women who have been put in the Hall of Fame in the 13 years that they have had this established, um, this custom of putting someone in every year and sometimes two people in a year, is that um, the Carter family, uh, which is composed of a man and two women, received this award three years ago, I think it was. And then uh, Patsy Cline is a, the other, only other woman, and hers was posthumous. She had been killed in an automobile, in an accident, airplane accident in 1963. And I was uh, actually the first single living woman to be put in the Hall of Fame and the absolute first comic. I'm the first representative of uh, comedy to go in the Hall of Fame. And uh, my award says on there, the plaque says, um, strange that I would memorize it, isn't it? <laughs> it's, I won't say the whole thing, but it says, although humor is the least recorded of all of the uh, country music um, forms of expression. Uh, it has been a part, Yuma has been a part of all the country shows down through the years since uh, country music became an art form in the country. And um, so I was very happy that at last Yuma was recognized because it's, it's very important to me that Yuma be recognized as part of the country music scene. What um uh, do you think the future offers to women as broadcasters and entertainers such as you? 
Well, it's been a great deal of, um, it's given me a great deal of pleasure to see the, the rise and the, the, the marvelous advances that have been made with women in broadcasting. Um, when I first came to the Opry, I can remember so well, the stations that I went into were all handled by men. All of the positions were held by men. Now, uh, it's been very interesting to me to, to go into radio stations and find women in all positions. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, they are engineers. They are uh, uh, the women around over the country that I've been into radio stations and have seen them operating the board, the, the lighting. The, they, they are filling all the positions that used to be handled by men, and I think it's very, very wonderful that we are becoming established as equal to the men in so many respects. Um, I'm not a woman lib nut by any chance, not a fanatic, but I do think that women have a right to exercise their um, prerogatives so far as, as skill and, and uh, uh, education and just the downright ability to hold down a job the same as a man can for the same amount of money, and that's what I'm after. <laughs> And what about you and Minnie Pearl? What future plans do you have? Well, uh, I would like to think uh, that as time passes, um, I will continue to be Minnie Pearl from time to time. And as long as my health holds out, which uh, fortunately I have been very fortunate to be very active. I play tennis and um, practice every day in the summertime. And two or three times a week during the winter in the inside courts. And I am a very act lead a very active life, and I hope to keep Minnie Pearl alive for many years. Uh, I wish I could be as ageless physically <laughs> as she is chronologically. But uh, I want you to know, all of you that are within the sound of my voice, that it's been a real great thrill to, to have an opportunity to bring someone like Minnie Pearl to broadcasting and, as a woman, to uh, be able to uh, work as I have uh, right along with the men and women in broadcasting and, and be proud of my profession. And we look forward to many years of watching and listening to you and Minnie Pearl. And I want you to know how much we do appreciate the, the love and the fun that Minnie Pearl has brought to listeners throughout the nation. Thank you so much. I've been talking with Sarah Ophelia Cannon, Minnie Pearl, who is a star of the Grand Ole Opry in Nashville, Tennessee, and who has been seen in many, many network programs throughout the world.